So first of all, I just want to acknowledge uh, my, my co-authors uh, for my talk today uh, from the University of Queensland, Cornell University, uh, and um, uh, the, the Queensland State Government. So who is uh, Hickey Lab? Uh, some of you might have uh, seen some of our videos on social media, and so yeah, we're a pretty young, this is some of them, I guess, and uh, we're a pretty young group uh, of researchers. Uh, we're about 15, uh, and we actually speak about 15 different languages. So we have a lot of fun using social media, um, and as Maricela said, I'm very passionate about communicating our research. I think it's something uh, that we need to do more of uh, to raise the profile of wheat improvement around the world. And so we can all benefit then through more funding. So, of course, uh, we, we, we heard a lot about the, challenge, the future challenges that we face in terms of feeding uh, all these extra mouths we're going to have by 2050. But uh, with, with rapidly evolving pathogens, and climate change is going to be very challenging. So certainly plant breeders need to respond faster to this changing environment if we're going to meet, meet the needs uh, for the future. So although I'm very passionate about wheat research and uh, wheat breeding, um, one thing for sure is that uh, it's pretty slow. And so here you can see a wheat breeder. He's pretty bored waiting for his wheat plants to grow. And um, it's simply because wheat breeding can take uh, 20 or more years. So when we think about taking a new gene from a, uh, uh, from a land race or something like this, it can take a breeding cycle or two to move that into adapted material, but it can actually take even longer to, to get that um, adapted material into an actual variety that's grown by farmers that have the right quality genes and package. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, so I guess I skipped a slide there, but no, that's cool. Um, so the speed breeding, so how do we speed up the generation advances? And I guess people have uh, developed uh, a number of ways to do this. And so uh, you heard from Trez uh, earlier as the keynote. And, and so they're really on top of, uh, companies like this are really on top of uh, fast tracking their breeding cycles. But, you know, if we go back a while, uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug, uh, as you all know, developed this uh, shuttle breeding system where they moved the wheat breeding program uh, in, the, in the same year uh, material from the north to the south. And so they achieved two generations of wheat uh, per year. So, um, and it also enabled uh, selection for broad adaptation too with those different conditions. Double haploid technology is, is, is one system that uh, a lot of the companies are using and we use it also for our research. Um, it can reduce the time to yield testing by uh, fixing the genes very quickly. However, it can be quite costly, especially when you start to think about uh, doing this at large scale. So if you wanted to do 50,000, 100,000 double haploid lines, it can quickly add up. And of course, it also requires specialized facilities, skill sets, um, and also you can't perform this early generation selection, uh, which sometimes can be quite beneficial. So the speed breeding innovation, I guess about Eight years ago or so at the University of Queensland, we were, a bit, we were kind of inspired by NASA. We heard NASA were growing uh, or trying to grow wheat in space and so uh, for, uh, to provide a food source for long uh, shuttle missions. And so the way that they were doing that it was, was to speed up the plant development, so to, to actually use constant light photo periods. Uh, so we thought that would be a cool tool to apply to our research to speed everything up if we could get it to work. And, um, yeah, but, but it's not a new concept. Uh, if we go back through the literature, uh, actually people in Russia in the early 1900s were playing with this in an experimental way. Uh, so yeah, lots of people around the world had, have been playing with it, definitely. So over the, time, over the last eight years, we, we started playing with it. We ended up, uh, when we first did it, we had very crappy plants. Um, you know, they, they, they so, and, and we've optimized it over this time, so including the potting mix, lighting, etc. And, and a key part of this whole process is actually achieving healthy plants in the system. And so we've adapted it now to wheat and barley, uh, and we achieve up to six generations of wheat uh, per year. Um, and so and we employ this uh, system wherever possible. So just to give you an idea of what we're actually targeting, uh, this is, um, I've been told that this is uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug's uh, favorite equation, um, the genetic gain over time. And so you have these factors, selection intensity, selection accuracy, genetic variance, and years per cycle. And so 
That's what we're targeting with this system. Shuttle breeding was targeting it many years ago and still to this day. Uh, and, and so speed breeding is, is targeting uh, this aspect by reducing the length. So just to show, highlight to you again, um, this is, I guess, a more of a traditional uh, uh, breeding program. And so speed breeding is targeting this line development phase. So where we go from making a cross to in development of inbred lines through this SSD uh, process. Um, so we're, we're, we're taking that, 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 part, that phase of the, of the breeding program and, and shrinking it. And if we could, in theory, do that, uh, you know, we have the potential to, to double the rate of genetic gain in many breeding programs. Like I said, a lot of commercial companies are onto it already. Uh, many in Australia are actually implementing a form of this bee breeding uh, already, and we're working with a, numbers, a number of companies as well. So I thought I could talk about speed breeding to you, or I could take you guys to the speed breeding system. So uh, that's exactly what uh, we're going to do. One of the glass houses we have here at the University of Queensland fitted with lights to extend the photo period. In this glass house we can control the temperature plus or minus one degree so it gives us great precision to manipulate plant growth. Of course uh, we often change the photo period from constant light to accelerate plant development sometimes to diurnal photo periods depending on what we're doing. In this glass house we have about 4,000 F2 plants. It's all trying to develop recombinant inbred uh, mapping populations to map new resistance genes to rust. So you can see all around me the diversity in terms of plant height, maturity. So, it's, so the, these plants are growing super fast. We're growing these plants in 100 cell trays. Now it's 10 by 10 cells. And you can see when we grow them in this system, they generally produce one spike, one tiller each. And that's enough for the purpose, particularly for a single seed descent when we only want one seed. Now, often we grow the wheat or barley plants in pots like these. They're called ANOVA pots. And they've got one small hole in the bottom and it, let, it, it prevents the roots from coming out. Now, the, the media that we use uh, this is actually pine bark mix um, and we add osmocote when we're potting up. Uh, that's a slow release fertilizer but we also add liquid fertilizer as if we don't do this we have a lot of problems with nutrient deficiencies because the plants are growing so fast. So they really need those nutrients readily available otherwise we run into problems like uh, uh, copper, uh, calcium and iron deficiencies. So now you've seen where all the magic happens, but it's actually midnight here, so it's time for me to get some rest. Not for the wheat plants though, they'll keep growing. I'll catch you later. You've had a, uh, a tour now inside the speed breeding system. Um, and of course, like uh, I can only cover so much in this talk and we know a lot of tricks to get the plants to grow really quickly and I'm happy to share uh, everything I know uh, about this and uh, all the phenotyping systems that we're developed. So please uh, come and talk to me or send me an email and I'll tell you everything. Um, so just to give you an idea, uh, here we have a, uh, when we harvest the, the spikes, we harvest them green. So uh, they're only, this is, we actually harvest them two weeks after anthesis. So you can see here, this is a Suntop spike. Uh, Suntop's a very popular wheat variety in the east coast of Australia. Uh, but yeah, you can see it's, ten, it's 11 days post anthesis. The grains are formed. Yeah, sure, they're not fully developed, but uh, we can actually harvest at this stage. We dry them down in a dehydrating oven, uh, and then we uh, imbibe them in, in dishes like this. And you can see they're quite shriveled. Um, they don't look the best, but they absorb that water, and we we put them into the fridge for several days, pull them out, and we end up with 
90 to 90 percent germination. So it means that you don't need uh, embryo rescue to use this system. We can do it with thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of grains without uh, doing that embryo rescue process. So we thought we can go fast, that's fantastic, uh, but why not select for some desirable traits along the way? And so if we started to do that, of course, uh, we could enrich breeding populations with some pretty uh, uh, useful characteristics. And so uh, again, back to the genetic gain uh, equation, this is the elements we're targeting. Selection intensity, because we're starting to do that, and uh, selection accuracy, so improving the accuracy as much as possible. And so one of the first traits we started working with was grain dormancy for pre-harvest sprouting tolerance, and we had much, a, a lot of success with this. And so we thought, well, what are some other traits we could work with? And so we started thinking rust, because rust is a very important disease in wheat. And so um, I must say, uh, thanks to uh, the University of Sydney uh, uh, group, including Robert Park, Emil Bansall, Harbins, uh, the whole team down there, they, they, they taught me a lot about rust and were really critical to, to, to getting us to use the system. So generally, in a nutshell, we thought, well, it could be a good system to actually screen for rust because it could be, we could do it all year round in this rapid cycling system. And uh, of course, it might minimize some field variation as well. So there could be some benefits there because we know sometimes there's challenges uh, when we do screening for rust in the field. So when we first started this work on rust, strike rust was the first one we, we, we started playing with. And we went about and we uh, did a number of experiments looking at factors like age, photo period, uh, post-inoculation temperatures, because we know these things are very important for expression of uh, APRs or adult plant uh, resistances. So basically, in a nutshell, we found that uh, we grew the plants for three weeks under constant light. Uh, they resembled uh, adult plant phenotypes, so they started to display uh, resistance typical of adult plants in the field, particularly on the third and fourth leaf. And so that, was, uh, that worked pretty nice. And so we were also finding a nice relationship between you know, this bee breeding system and the field. You know, uh, actually, uh, some, some work had been done by uh, Zach Pretorius in this space as well earlier, so it was very promising and, and, uh, that we could, we could get it to work based on his findings as well. So we went about, well, I don't know if you guys have seen the taco ad, but it's like uh, soft tacos, hard tacos, why don't we have both? And uh, so that's exactly what we were thinking. And so why don't develop a system for uh, triple rust resistance in the, in, the, in the speed breeding? So that's exactly what we did. It enables simultaneous selection for all three rusts. Uh, we can do it in six weeks. It enables uh, nine consecutive cycles uh, per year using the same bench space. And it was important that we designed it in a way that was high throughput. So because we're starting to screen for multiple traits, it means that we need to deal with large population sizes to combine all these genes. And so um, we, we did it in this cell-based uh, system. Uh, and, of, and we also developed a technique for, that enabled you to cross the selected plants that have gone through the screen in that same plant generation, so, which is in very important because they are the special ones that have those unique gene combinations. And if you do it the next generation, they segregate and you cross onto susceptible plants. So we basically transplanted the selected plants after the adult screen into pots, give them some fertilizer, lower the temperature, they retiller, and then we can do what we want. We can intercross, we can back cross, we can do so all sorts of crazy things. But if you imagine, uh, I'm, I'm a wheat plant, and so on the lower leaves, on the third and fourth leaf, uh, we, we evaluate the strike rust. On the upper leaves, on the flag and flag minus one, it's leaf rust, so now I'm not, not a teapot. But, uh, and then on the, stem, on the stem rust, we score the stem rust on the stems, where it's, in, it's important. So we're evaluating these pathogens on different parts of the plant. So, I'll give you a very short outline of the process, but we grow the plants for three weeks under constant light, accelerates plant development to the stem elongation phase. We inoculate them with stripe rust. Um, obviously, they go into an inoculation chamber at low temperature for, for infection. We bring them out. Uh, we, actually, we actually change the settings in the speed breeding system to diurnal conditions, which favors pathogen development and lower the night temperature uh, for that three or four days, which is critical for setting that uh, that response. 
We then inoculate with a combination of leaf and stem rust. So we actually layer on the stem rust on the stems by separating the plants with our arm and then leaf rust over the top. So it's a bit of a, it's like an artwork, if you like. And so what we get is all three rusts uh, developing simultaneously so we can sort the plants on one day. So it saves, it saves work. So to give you an idea, this is sort of the different range of responses we see uh, for stem rust. So some pretty pictures. Uh, some, this is an example of a selected F2 plant. So you can see that restricted sporulation on the lower leaves for stripe rust, where we see that APR starting to kick in in genotypes that have it. And on the upper leaves, um, resistant response to leaf rust and stem rust. So we went about and we actually did a couple of case studies uh, applying these techniques um, to rapidly integrate multiple rust resistance uh, and grain dormancy, actually, into a couple of different genetic backgrounds. So we were for this case study, we were combining speed breeding system, uh, some, some crossing schemes, uh, so like intercrossing to combine the resistances and back crossing. Uh, so, so important for moving multiple genes or large numbers of genes. And high throughput phenotyping system that we developed, the triple rust screen, and high throughput DNA markers. So, we developed uh, backcross-derived integration lines within 18 months, um, and which involved screening the populations uh, three times, the segregating populations, and we did a backcross and an intercross in that period. And um, we, 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 we chose two, well, we, we did other varieties, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain two. We did two varieties uh, that were susceptible to rust, but they were widely grown uh, by farmers. And so before these uh, virulent uh, apathotypes took out the resistances. So we took wild catchum, and so you can see it, it's very promising. Um, a number of, a couple of companies are commercializing this material at the moment, and um, it, we're getting uh, promising uh, yield results from this material. And in fact, some lines are, are, are higher yielding than the original varieties we started with. So just from a case study point of view, it's just nice to see that you're making progress in terms of yield, not going backwards. So. Again, for H45, so this is a variety suited to uh, the uh, southern New South Wales and Victoria, and so uh, this is actually at a field day down there, attended by more than 300 farmers, and so they're all excited to grow this variety because it's rust resistant. It used, to, it, this is basically the same as H45. Uh, they, they know how to grow it, they want to grow it. So again, for me, it was just a really rewarding experience to see something that you've developed in the field and on its way to a farmer's field. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. So our, just to give you an idea, we work with uh, some companies. And so this is sort of like an example of what we can do. We've, we've talked, I talked a bit about rust screening, but so we, we deal with large population sizes and we integrate selection for other traits. So to give you an idea, we, we, we can screen a population size of about 40,000 individuals from across for grain dormancy. It's easy to deal with trade at the grain level because we can do, you know, use big germination trays and just select the dormant ones. We break the dormancy, transplant them into the speed breeding system, we screen them for yellow spot, easy trait to deal with at the seedling stage. We then do the triple rust, proceed with the triple rust screen, so all three rust pathogens, uh, reselect for plant height and maturity uh, because they're, they're correlated with the field, and uh, then we have a nice uh, small set, relatively small set of highly selected individuals. Uh, and, and these are the special ones. And, you know, uh, but it's important to note along the way, you need to maximize genetic diversity because otherwise you get to the field and guess what? Oh, they're all from the one family and they have some problem. So maximizing genetic diversity through any breeding pipeline is important. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you can, you can couple a genotyping platform on top of this and, uh, and so you can uh, select for genes, known genes, maybe that you can't select for in the system. So we're talking like grain quality genes or whatever. So we want to really integrate this technology with other technologies because this is just a tool. This is, this is not the answer by, its, by alone. Speed reading is not the answer alone. It has to be integrated. And so 
through, so through uh, with, with our work and collaboration with Jessica uh, from Cornell, uh, we're starting to integrate speed breeding with genomic selection. And so this is, gives you an idea of how we might start thinking about this. Um, so we had this rapid cycling system and we can make crosses very quickly and in theory if we're going twice as fast well then hey we might be able to double the rate of genetic gain from genomic selection in a pretty easy manner. So at the end of the day this system is, um, can be used to rapidly improve existing serial cultivars so that might have deficiencies. Gene pyramiding in top crosses so quickly combine so it's elite by elite you might want to combine a couple of traits really quickly. Um, and for rapid introduction of novel genes from land races, and this is something that we just thought was just too hard before, it was took too long. So with this sort of approach, we can speed that up and we can start working with more diverse alleles. This is a crazy slide, you thought what I had before was crazy, this is crazy, and so what if we had $30 million and what if we wanted to do something in the speed breeding space to help uh, have an impact in breeding programs around the world and Maybe you could build an uh, international trait integration center where, uh, where breeders from around the world could submit their varieties that might have deficiencies or breeding lines, and we could quickly plug them in uh, using speed breeding, phenotyping, and marker platforms uh, and quickly deliver them back those improved lines. Just an idea, but I'll leave a hat up the front here and you know, feel free. I'll leave you with this, uh, so this, this quote from Robert, I th uh, Bob was, was very relevant, I thought, rust resistance is just one aspect of a successful breeding program, so we have to consider these other, these other things. I want to acknowledge uh, the, the concepts from Mark Dieters and Ian DeLacy at the University of Queensland around speed breeding. I want to acknowledge my fabulous PhD students, I can't do anything without them, my colleagues at UQ. Um, my collaborators at the State Government in Queensland, CSIRO and University of Sydney and GRDC for uh, my personal development. They've provided scholarships, honours scholarships, PhD scholarships. They're now giving me scholarships for my students. Uh, their support and, uh, is very important for the future. Thank you.